too fast. Uh, I remember about a year or so ago, I read an article uh, from the University of uh, Idaho that uh, a researcher there had been working about 30 years on reprocessing, and he finally found that what he said was uh, the answer to it, and it was as simple as decaffeinating coffee. And he is now at Richland. Um, they've set up a lab doing extra work there on his uh, work from Idaho. And I just wonder if anybody has heard of him. Uh, I remember he was, um, I believe he had a Chinese name. I wish I'd looked up the article again. But he'd worked on this for about 30 years and felt that he had come up with some very simple answers. And they've been working on this for a couple of years now at Richland. So I don't I know. I wish I knew, but I don't. Oh, <laughs> I wish I had his name. Okay. I, I will say, I don't know the gentleman you're speaking of, but I will say this, just for the sake of it. Um, some of our best nuclear scientists are at Idaho National Lab. And that's the place where a lot of what we have now in terms of nuclear power and nuclear technology emanated from. That's where we do all of our nuclear Navy work. And the work that goes into the, the nuclear Navy program is absolutely the best on Earth. That doesn't mean it's commercially relevant, but a lot of the reprocessing technologies that, that Arriva uses, that other, country, that other companies and or countries use, grew out, not, not a lot of them, I should say, all of them, grew out of um, our defense programs and were and are being applied commercially. So um, that would be the place that these things happen if, uh, if, if he did find something. Since a lot of you obviously don't, aren't familiar with the National Labs, he mentioned Idaho Falls. It was run by Argonne National Lab for many years, and they did most of the traditional nuclear reactors most of that work was actually done there. That's where it, all that technology, you'll see in the movie, if you, if so hopefully you can stay around for Pandora's Promise, it's really, they, they, they show this reactor that was designed that they, it was actually almost foolproof. It's beautiful, it's a beautiful demonstration. And that was just scrap. That was done in Idaho Falls. Oak Ridge was started doing uranium enrichment, and then they concentrated on thorium reactors and fast breeder reactors. They didn't, they didn't do conventional reactors. Los Alamos and Livermore are, are national labs that are totally defense oriented, mainly nuclear weapons, warheads, preventing things. That's what they do. Brookhaven has been primarily science. Argonne in Chicago is primarily science. The, 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 the defense style was in Idaho. And then the last one, of course, is Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which is purely science. There's no classified work done in there at all. So th there, each of the big national labs have a different one. And so I think it's important to know that that's why it was done in Idaho, because that was the conventional reactors. I'll uh, add to that. The, some of the problems that we've had, uh, I think in past years, I think it's always been with us, is again, the problem that we're having with Yucca Mountain uh, is an issue that needs to be discussed and resolved, and it's made political by the politicians. Unfortunately, our national laboratories are also controlled by the politics. Uh, and what happens is they'll start on certain programs that, that need to be done for the entire country, and then they'll be pulled off when there's an administration change. That's what we must change. That's why I believe in the public-private environment, and I think the, the Heritage Foundation feels that way too. We have got to separate science and engineering from anything political in this country, and probably worldwide. Because the only way that we can advance is through entrepreneurial development, when people think that there's an answer. If you're working simply for uh, a government agency, that's it. How many people of those earlier I spoke about C students go to work for an agency where they have a lifetime job? or in the education system, a lifetime job. Uh, we're, we're, we're losing our uh, ability to foster entrepreneurship in this country, and that's what's killing us economically. Somebody else. A question, anybody? Um, uh, 
we're always talking about shipping nuclear waste, but that's only half the equation in my mind. We have, I'm guessing, live material going to power plants all over the country already. I'm curious how that is shipped, uh, what kind of form it is, um, as it goes through routes like Vegas already. And there's also a military applications such as nuclear warheads and such as well. I'm just kind of curious what maybe the ratio is, how much more dangerous it is compared to nuclear waste. Surprise, should I take this on? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, and I'm looking out at my brain trust, uh, that material is shipped by the Office of Secure Transportation. So the Office of Secure Transportation will not tell you when they're going, where they're going, what routes, and there's armed guards in front and behind. So it's pretty safe. And again, you've seen some, of, I, I love seeing that video when they crash in those trucks in the wall. Gosh, I want that job. Um, uh, after I saw that, I was pretty much on board. It's a real after test for the that. airbags, I can tell you. That. Yeah. And after I saw that, uh, that video, I, I, was, I was on board. Um, and I'm going to ramble for a minute here because this is what I do if I could. I, I wondered why I was, you know, asked to speak. But after listening a bit, um, some of the stuff, uh, you know, we, there's a new process and we can do this. Sounds like science fiction. And I mentioned Ed Hansen before. And I got to spend a few afternoons with this gentleman uh, speaking about his history and the beginnings of, of nuclear science and uh, I'm a big, I, I'm an author so I'm a big fan of Asimov and uh, not so much Clark because he wants to tell me how everything works but Asimov would write like a fellow flicked his cigarette into the nuclear ashtray on the desk. He didn't tell us how it worked but there was, they all wrote with this great promise for nuclear energy and we did until Three Mile Island and Jane Fonda and the movie and suddenly we're all going to die. Um, so I, I think somehow we need to recapture that, uh, that dream. I think it's still possible. Nuclear energy, can, we can do so much. Of course, there are waste products. And most of this, though, the stuff that we're calling waste is just spent uh, fuel, used fuel. There's still a lot of energy in there. But we're afraid to go after it. So Office of Secure Transportation, I believe the uh, more intelligent people will speak now. Um, I, I don't know about intelligent, more intelligent, but um, the, uh, the question had to do with uh, what we call fresh fuel, which is unirradiated. It's the fuel that's manufactured uh, and then uh, sent to a reactor uh, to be irradiated. Uh, fresh fuel is, is not very ra radioactive at all. In fact, if it were sitting right here, it wouldn't harm me. So that fuel is transported. It is transported in secure containers, um, and, um, and, and it's sent from fuel plants, like the one that Arriva operates in uh, Richland, Washington, uh, to reactors in the US. The other part of the question had to do with uh, weapons. <clears throat> I don't know much about the weapons program, but I think Gary is, uh, uh, is uh, not Gary, Dan. 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 Sorry, I think uh, Dan is right. All of that is done in very secure transport. But again, um, you know, there's a great deal of difference between a nuclear weapon and fuel uh, used for nu commercial nuclear reactors. But the uh, the original fuel that goes to a reactor I is very very lightly uh, irradiated, or is not irradiated, but it's very lightly radioactive. Once it comes out, it's very uh, radioactive. Well, ac actually what you get is it's called fuel assemblies. And uh, you, c you can go Google this and you can see all the pictures you want to look at. But they're usually about between 14 inches by 14 inches or up to maybe 20 inches by 20 inches, maybe about 15 feet tall. And there's zircaloy or a special kind of exotic metal that's the tubes, which people like to call fuel rods. And in those fuel tubes or that metal are these pellets so they're captured in the tube, and those tubes are assembled into what's called a fuel assembly. And that's what's loaded into the reactor core. And those are shuffled every time you need to refuel the reactor. So they come already housed 
inside of a sealed tube created into an assembly that gets loaded into the reactor, right? And, and, they're, store, and they're transported in a similar kind of a very strong containers that you actually store the fuel in later. Not, not quite that strong, but very sturdy, durable containers. And the people build these in, in plants and their workers wearing, you know, uh, coveralls and, a, and some white gloves and they're assembled very nicely with uh, you know an assembly thing. And these are people standing there working with it with their hands. Now there's no special suits that they're wearing and there's no radiation barriers. It's a simple process. It's just uranium. But I'll ask the, the, the group a question. Where, where's the largest mine or source of uranium on the planet? Right, we have mines, we're mining uranium. Where's the largest uranium mine capable mine in the world? Anybody got any, huh? Well, there are mines like in Africa, Australia, Canada, huh? Yeah, Canada, uranium mines in Canada, right? They're all D students like me, Bruce. Okay, so Sorry. Um, amazingly enough, if I gave you a pie chart, and I did a presentation recently for the Utah Association of Municipal Power Systems Organization, because Utah wants to build a nuclear plant, uh, maybe a couple, in competition with Nevada, by the way, sounds like. Um, and uh, so I did some more research work on this. So if you took a pie chart, you made a pie chart, and you said uranium in this one location versus all the uranium mines known today, the pie would look very small, be a, a hair's line of what's in the mines, and everything else is in the ocean. The largest source of uranium is in the ocean, right? Mm. So if you like to go to the ocean and swim, you're swimming in uranium, right? And, you, and we've actually uh, several times have uh, developed a process to actually go extract uranium out of the oceans as a source of fuel if we actually needed it. So it's, it lives with us everywhere, like every other radioactive isotope. It's everywhere we go. Well, let's see. Um, if you sleep next to somebody, for a whole year, whoever that person might be, you'll get exposed to maybe about 60 to 80 millirem because potassium is radioactive, so bananas are radioactive, you're radioactive, and when you sit next to somebody, you're irradiating them, and oh, by the way, you're radiating yourself, okay? So the world is full of radiation, um, and in and, and most cases, nobody really thinks about it, like you don't think about it when you're eating a McDonald's fry, how that might be clogging your arteries, you just eat the fry. And nobody's giving you the rundown on how dangerous it might be because you don't want to hear about it because it tastes good. So it's a simple thing, it really truly is, to take a look, and, and I would agree with everybody and everything we're doing here, it's about education. Because you fear what you don't understand. And that's what we're doing, right? We don't for whatever the state of Nevada has fear of, I'm not sure what the leadership is fearing. One day maybe the guy will actually come up and say it's the casino guys throwing me, you know, in some cement shoes in Lake Tahoe or something. But whatever it is, you know, um, it's a lack of understanding how it really actually works. Other questions? Jump up. Uh, it is the comment as when you were talking about the Nevadans for carbon for energy. Is this working all right? Take it off if you need to, sir. A little low. Uh, I had a neat opportunity a year ago to, we were talking about Lawrence Livermore Labs over there, and I had a, we're actually a manufacturer of equipment that's used for nuclear processing and that kind of thing, and I had a neat opportunity to go to Lawrence Livermore Labs, and if anybody ever gets the chance, look at their website, and they've got a, they're working on fusion power over there. And I talked to a couple of the political types here in Nevada because there's, there's a neat application for fusion power. Uh, they're doing some testing using what they call the National Ignition Facility over there, trying to reach break even for fusion power. And, uh, you know, along with the wind and the solar and the other things in the, in the energy park here in Nevada, I think it'd be a neat place to try and push the political people into building the first fusion power plant here in Nevada uses very little water. There's a neat applications where it can be used for actually burning up some of the spent fuel, what they call a hy uh, hybrid fuel pellet, where they can uh, actually dispose of some of the uh, 
spent fuel in the fusion process. You know, it's still a few years off, but if they were to spend a fraction of the amount of money they throw at Solyndra and some of these other things to develop that kind of power, uh, I think they could probably do some neat things. Uh, th these are the th one second, uh, Dennis. These are the things that we need to try and understand is that our research in nuclear technology has really only been done by private companies in the last 30 years because the government has been unfair about allocating the funds. I've, I've visited Idaho National Lab a couple of three times now. It's just incredible what they are doing and what they could be doing. But it's the politics that's stopping them from continuing to move forward and developing a technology transfer from what they have into the private market. And the at, at some point in time, us low-life citizens, speaking mostly of myself, have got to be able to educate each other so that we can understand this and then stop that tide of political insanity that's going on. Go ahead, Dennis. Okay, let me just, for the audience's sake and for your education purposes, I've spent years at Livermore working on projects. Um, as you know, they shut down the underground test site in Nevada many years ago. Why did they shut it down? One simple reason. Lawrence Livermore National Lab wanted to build NIF. There was a predecessor to NIF, the National Ignition Facility. It was eight laser beams. This is, a, I think it's 112. Very high intensity laser beams, very fast pulses. What? 119? One, 92. Is it 192? I thought it was 118. But may, maybe that was the interim number then they got, Hurst got it going. That, that's Don's age, right? Anyway, Don? the bottom line is, is that what happened is, is that they're losing a lot of their funding now because they promised break even within like eight or nine years. They only got to win one one thousandth, so 0.1% of break even. You say, well, the project's a failure. No, the whole purpose of the project was the fact that we got rid of the nuclear test and you can simulate the nuclear test with the little explosions. That's the whole purpose. So it's still going, but not for fusion energy. We're, we're a factor of a thousand away from fusion energy right now with that, with, with that type of technology. Other questions? Yeah, I, I would like to add, though, I, I, I work there. I go to, it, it, and thank you for bringing up fusion energy. But I work with Dr. Ed Moses there at the site currently. I was there actually a week ago for a debrief on their latest uh, successes. And they have a plant that's designed called LIFE. It's called Laser Inertial Fusion Energy. And you're absolutely right. When, like breaking the sound barrier, we break the barrier of fusion, however we do that, um, that opens up the whole new world of energy. And fission reactors, really are just a, uh, a um, sort of interim or a transition f power until we can get to fusion. Because once we get to a fusion energy source, like the speed of sound, once we break through and we can go beyond it and get net positive energy, which a lot of people don't believe, especially some smart people, but when that happens, it changes to all the dynamics because there is no used fuel when that happens. And if you go to the NIF, National Ignition Facility website, you can see how exactly the process works. You can look at the life plant on that website. They have animations on how it works. It's very brilliant. And um, they love doing tours. So uh, you can get a group together. You can go down and actually take a look at it and walk the facility. It's incredibly amazing what they've built there and what they're doing. And uh, yes, they are having trouble with funding. And uh, they really want to shift gears from being a thought of as a uh, facility for, you know, emulating uh, potential bombs to a facility designing fusion for future uh, power, which uh, will change the complete dynamics of energy on this planet. I'd like to just add a word on fusion as well. Um, it is true that fusion's promising. It's been around for a long time, and it's been promising for a long time. It's also true we have about six fusion programs funded throughout the federal government, and there's basically two technologies out there. So while I'm not saying we should or shouldn't fund fusion programs, but it's something that there are multiple programs out there. The magnetic fusion guys will say that the, the laser guys are wasting our time and our money. 
So th <laughs> there's a debate out there about fusion, and I'm not sure how to move forward on it. There's a big international program. I'm not a big international guy, but I think this might be an area where international cooperation makes some sense. So I don't know. I, I would just, with a lot of these things, look, I'm just skeptical of government putting forth investments that lead to something that has all this commercial promise. If it was so commercially promising, then you would have private investment going into that. And you do actually have some infu infusion. That's another group who will question the national funding strategy for fusion, that it crowds out the private. So if you're interested in fusion, it's worth investigating a little bit deeper than just us saying it's got a lot of promise, which it does. I'm going to just add one comment to that that makes it kind of a, a funny story. When I first moved, went to Oak Ridge in 1979, about that time they had a they had an, a, a, a magnetic fusion device that he was talking. That's why I brought it up. It's called the Elmo Bumpy Taurus. Okay. They also had a big facility at Princeton for years. That's now shut down to study it. But all of a sudden one day they had neutron detectors because one of the things you're looking for is neutrons coming out in a nuclear reactor. And they got all excited and there was all this babble around the lab. Oh, did you hear what happened? But then they turned the machine off and the neutron pulses kept coming. It turns out that's the same facility that does the warhead stuff and somebody accidentally put two pieces of highly enriched uranium in the same barrel and it started expanding and contracting and giving bursts to neutrons out. That's a government facility. That's a government facility. <laughs> I'd like to point out that a fluoride salt nuclear reactor will always be cheaper and more economical than a fusion reactor. Fusion reactor, the Tomahawk, for example, will never come into existence because the neutron flux is so severe that the erosion rate on the walls are one millimeter a year. That's not economically viable. It'll never happen. You know, there's other sources of energy, hydroelectric, the Gulf Stream, uh, as I said, fluoride salt nuclear reactors are far more economical and cheaper to operate and to build than uh, the uh, imaginations of nuclear scientists who want to go fusion. They've been promising this for years, a hundred years from now, they'll still be promising it and they won't get there. Yeah, in, you know, in that, that's the kind of talk that I, I, don't, I don't get how many millimeters and uh, newton and whatever. I don't get that, I'm sorry. But no matter what happens, if Tony Stark uh, drops in tomorrow and gives us his reactor and we have clean, free energy, we're still gonna have all this other stuff. Somebody got Tony Stark, thank you. Um, <laughs> we're still gonna have <clears throat> the spent fuel that's sitting out there now and it needs to go somewhere. So, you know, I, I great. I think it's a, we should investigate all these things. I don't think the, Federal government should be the guys to decide which which technologies are best and put all our money into it, like the Heritage Foundation says. That that's not where, you know, federal government should pick winners and losers. Anyway, my point is we still have this immediate problem, why we're looking for the great breakthrough, and although we do have solar plants in Nye County or plants or uh, projects, and we welcome anybody who wants to spend money on it, come out to Nye County, we'll let you put them up. They're not going to, they're nowhere close to being as uh, efficient as nuclear reactors, in my opinion. I, I would, uh, I think maybe timing wise, uh, I know everybody's getting uh, cross eyed like myself, but that's normal for myself anyway. But uh, I would like to know what this uh, panel of uh, at least B or A students compared to my, uh, my world of D and C. Uh, I would like to know what they think, each of you guys, uh, about the effort that we are doing with this concept and about our effort to try and educate the grassroots public of a society versus trying to educate or not the uh, political world of things. And I have to say this with the uh, Nye County commissioners sitting right at the table. Uh, I, I think it's very important that they got to a place where they learned and understand this thing. I'm going out next week and hammering Washoe County that they join this group and sign off on this. In the last couple of weeks, I've gotten a lot of uh, potential 
political players in Nevada to sign the, uh, the Nye County concept of a referendum to at least finish the, ed the uh, study uh, uh, for the Yucca Mountain, what do they call that study, Bob? Uh, the uh, the safety evaluation report. Study. Yeah, the sa safety evaluation report study, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, these include some players down in uh, uh, Clark County. Uh, Michelle Fiore is a, is a, a legislator down there. Uh, Jim Wheeler signed off on it. I mean, they read this uh, referendum petition and they signed it and I have the copy of it. Uh, and uh, Sharon Angle signed it, a uh, uh, former contender. And Sue Loudon, her competitor for that race against Harry Reid, and uh, I didn't pull it off in time, but I was trying to get Sue Loudon and Sharon Angle to be right here. Two former uh, uh, foes running for politics right in Harry Reid's face. So I, I don't know if these are the kind of things that we need to do. It seems like that to some degree. But I, I need to know from these guys what we should be doing. And I see you people as a core of people who do understand and that by, if anything else, you have, have come to a different place in understanding what is going on with uh, uh, nuclear spent, uh, not spent, that's the other word. Used. Used fuel, I know. I'll have that in a few days. When you guys get to be my age, you can talk to me. But aside from that, um, that's the key. So let's go, Bruce, hammer me. What, what do we do, right or wrong here? Be okay, yeah, it takes a second to light up. So uh, this is a great event. Gary did a great job. Um, yes, hands off to Gary. Good, good work. It would have been nice to see about standing room only uh, with a lot of people asking a lot of other questions. That's round two. So um, what I would see is absolutely more education is needed and more public support is needed because you can't build what, what Nye County wants to build and in at Yucca Mountain without the support of the people of the state of Nevada. And what is that? Well, that's everybody here voting to say, we want this in some fashion, whatever that is, referendum or just a lot of pressure or everybody agreeing by county. I don't know how that works exactly for the state of Nevada. My suggestion would be that you, there's a very successful process called town hall meetings. And they happen, they're from six o'clock to eight o'clock at night. You get a panel full of uh, distinguished people like yourself, Gary, and maybe a few others to sit up there and talk about what we did today in sort of a short version and let a standing room only group of people from the local community come in and ask questions. And you can do those in every county. You can do them on Monday nights, Tuesday nights, because weekends are sacred to people. Uh, most town hall meetings happen uh, middle of the week sometime, you look around the local baseball schedules, soccer schedules, and all that, and you go, hey, Wednesday nights are a great night in whatever it is, Paul Rub, and we're going to go do a town hall meeting there, and uh, the leadership of uh, Nye County is going to somehow put it together, find a big uh, school. It doesn't have to be a casino. You know, it can be a school place. It can be in any kind of uh, free facility so you can keep the cost down. And then let it be an open forum. Let people get excited. Let the media come in and write stories about it. And you can do those every single week in some new location. They don't, have, they don't cost a lot of money and you don't need a lot of high powered people there to impress the people in the audience. And it can be about jobs, it can be about the future of Nevada, it could be about whatever you think is gonna get the people in the room to discuss the opportunity of Nevada supporting uh, used fuel storage and used fuel reprocessing and for John and the other guys, a clean energy park that has it all. I mean, so you can talk about all those subjects with the, with the idea that, you know, Nevada's got some great opportunities. Bob? Yeah, um, Gary asked me the same question last night, and um, my answer was basically I think uh, what's needed is a traveling road show, um, which is pretty close to what Bruce just said with the town hall meetings. I think that you Every citizen in Nevada needs to hear the story. And uh, many of them, most of them probably don't want to hear the story, but they'll read the newspapers or listen to the radio, watch TV. 
So I think you, there's a need to have a traveling road show meetings in every significant community uh, in Nevada. I, as much as I'd like to be there, I really think it needs to be Nevada citizens who are speaking and not outsiders who will be perceived as mercenaries. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I think the, uh, the idea of getting out and touching as many of the Nevada citizens as possible is, is the right thing to do. You might consider, and maybe it's already been done, I don't know about it, but um, conducting a poll, a scientific poll, uh, quietly, don't do it. I wouldn't advertise it in advance, but then um, when you, once you get the uh, results, share it with the, uh, the governor and the, and the uh, Nevada delegation. You know, let them see where the citizens are. I'm pretty sure, based on what I've heard today, it would come out uh, positive. But, um, you know, without some kind of evidence uh, that the public is in favor, most politicians, not most, every politician, w will stay away from the subject until they think that their job is in jeopardy, meaning that they could be uh, removed from office um, because the citizenry don't agree with them on their stance on, on Yucca Mountain. Real quick, uh, I think that uh, the one thing we really have going for us in Nevada in general is that we only have four representatives and one of them is on our side. He came today. So you need to encourage him. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with what the previous speaker said. It's all about education. It's about framing it as opportunity not framing, I mean, it, it is an, a, a great opportunity. And uh, doing more things like this. Anything else I have to say would just be repetitive of, of what these gentlemen already said. Yeah, and I'll, so I'll repeat what they said too. Um, I like the idea of a rolling thunder review. I think that's great. Um, uh, but until you get uh, politicians in this state convinced that Harry Reid's not right and they can win office, and be a supporter of this. Um, I, I don't know how that's gonna work. I know in the rurals, we get elected regularly. I was, this is the only office I've ever run for and the only one I wanna have. But uh, I've been openly in favor of Yucca Mountain and got 65% of the vote. So, but that's in the rurals. And you have a bigger anti-nuke contingent in Clark County. Um, but they've, uh, to their, I think, I'm just gonna say what I think, sorry guys. To their shame, many politicians have used this as a fear tactic to get reelected. I'll keep this evil waste out if you elect me. It's, you know. Um, so I don't know the public needs to be as much uh, educated as politicians need to grow a backbone and do what's right. Um, so these guys are cringing now, I know. But my staff always stands close to me, so I don't say the wrong thing. But. But that's what I think. That's really where it is uh, for me. But it, it sure would sure wouldn't hurt to, you know, put a rolling thunder review and go to dif different communities and say, look, these are the real facts. And by the way, make sure you make sure you bring the video of the trains and trucks crashing into walls because that's good. Well, I, I think you know I would agree with you, but in my perspective, kind of like your 401k or your investment fund, you don't invest in one thing. You guys want to go beat around like Gary's been doing for the last few years and yelling and screaming about Nevada politics. It, I, I, you know, hey, insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a new result, right? That's why Gary's got you know a little bit of a twist going on here because he realizes where he was going wasn't getting anywhere. So yeah, go beat on those guys. Go beat on them with a petition signed by a million and a half Nevadans saying we want this or you're out. That, that's a pretty good way to negotiate with that character. Right, and that's, that's why I started uh, that resolution my first month in office, and we have seven counties. I'm working it. Uh, oh, no, you're, you're doing I'm working it, it that way. Yeah, you're doing great. Now, now go result. out and get all the, go, go out, now you've, you've done it, but now go out and get all these, educate all these people to stand behind you. Yeah, I need, I need help getting to your yeah. local yeah. elected officials. All of your county commissioners and all of the uh, state and federal uh, elected officials in this in this state have received a letter and a copy of this resolution. Is that right, Cash? 
a copy of a letter and a fact sheet. Your county commissioner's got a copy of a resolution of the resolution. Um, so, any of you know any of them or who can get to them? Start writing them letters. Call them up. Go stand out in front of their house. Get groups to yell at them because they do that real well. If you get a, a majority of people in their meeting yelling something at them, they will cow to that group because they think that uh, they're a democracy. They forget we're a republic. I watched, um, I was recently trying to help recover the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station from a challenging event they had with some components that weren't working they installed in their plant. Ultimately, the, the utility decided to shut the plant down. But I watched the uh, anti-nuclear or environmental group or green groups uh, go after a, a bleeding body in the water, like a shark. And it was very tactical. And they do it well. Uh, you know, Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility, Mothers for Peace, Greenpeace, uh, Sierra Club, uh, they all work together jointly. If, if on the pro side of things that you're trying to accomplish, if you could actually work like the anti people do in the fashion that they're successful at, you can make it work and they do it extremely well. They show up at a meeting like this, there'll be 20 of them mixed in 300 people with a certain agenda and at a certain time they'll speak a certain thing and they don't have a problem dropping tears on the audience and talking about their dying children and their grandbabies are gonna have three eyes. And I mean, they're really, really good at it. I would suggest that you could think about the same tactics that make them successful or the tactics make you successful. I mean, it's working for them, it's just on the other side of it. And you can do it that way um, because who, in fact, is, they are probably a better alliance for you, the anti-nuclear people right now, because they want, especially in California, I guarantee you, Rochelle Becker, who's a very famous anti-nuke gal, who's been trying to kill Diablo Canyon since it was before it was built, uh, would run on the, would get on the train and run with the fuel to, to Yucca Mountain. I mean, California would come out here and help you because they want the fuel out of that state, and so do a lot of the other states. So those people can be a force for you, not against you. What are they gonna say? Oh, we don't wanna store it in the ground. We wanna get away from the sites. We wanna, oh, we'll send it into space. That's what we'll do. So the fact is, you have a lot of horsepower sitting out there and they're good at what they do. Get them on your side. Yeah, I, I agree, you know, it's funny though, because the biggest people who are shutting down Bright Source, which is on the California, it's right on our border, are the environmental people. The environmental people are protesting solar energy. I mean, it, it, they're, it's just insane. But when I, get, when I get an issue and Sierra Club comes in and I get letters from uh, all, all around that don't live in my uh, district and in my uh, county, I, I, I ignore them. I write back to them and tell them, when you move here, I'll listen to you, otherwise shut up. So, uh, I, I, you know, the local politicians will listen to the local people. But uh, you're right, they have great tactics, they know how to do it. And, and they, they play with you. I mean, you realize that the environmental folks, and, and it's a good thing we have somebody on the other side because if you go look about the men who built America, like J.P. Morgan and Westinghouse and all these guys, I mean, they're still dumping nasty stuff into rivers and things, they just didn't care. They don't care about workers, they don't care about the environment, they just did their thing. So somebody had to step up. Oh, it swung the other way. I mean, frankly, people are just bad for the planet. So if you want the planet to be happy, just get rid of the people. So, I mean, I mean, if you get down to the facts, but as a matter, the matter of fact is we, we really wanna be engaged with the planet. We wanna be part of what's going on. We need to work it all together and uh, there's a certain balance in there. Nonetheless, those people are actually an asset to your efforts and I don't see them being activated. I would welcome them because they would come here and say, yes, we wanna help you put it somewhere other than California or whatever it is, Texas or some other state and they'd be happy to pay a lot of money to have that done. Uh, I bet there's a couple of politicians in Nevada that would like that I was the first to volunteer to leave the planet. That's not gonna happen. I'd like to volunteer one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess uh, we can wrap this up, folks, and uh, we're gonna run the video right away. Uh, well, in a probably five minutes or so. Um, I think these guys, I, I don't know if they're going to be hanging around. I did want to do one or two more uh, interviews, uh, video interviews. We're trying to record this uh, so that we have something to be able to demonstrate to others uh, and see if we can find, uh, expand other groups and things like this. 
Uh, Ken, do you have any final word? And, and uh, Don Kaplan uh, is the guy that uh, really helped us put this together. Couldn't have done it without Don. I just, just wanted to say that that video will be uh, Pandora's Promise. That runs about, I think, about 85 minutes. It's a very interesting movie to watch. It has been on CNN, but uh, Gary got an exclusive right to display it for the first time in public. So I realize it's getting late, but if you want to enjoy a nice movie, we don't have any popcorn, but uh, I think it's over there by the arcade. You might be able to get it, and then we'll get that going in about five minutes. Thank you.